The secretary will read the first to the sixth orders together. Orders of the day, medium term budget policy statement. The second order, introduction, adjustment appropriation bill. The third order, introduction, rates and monetary amount and uh, amendment, uh, amendment of laws bill, the third one, taxation laws amendment bill, the fifth one, introduction, ESCOM debt relief, relief amendment bill, the sixth one, introduction, revenue laws amendment bill. I now recognize the Honorable the Minister of Finance. Honorable Speaker, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, His Excellency Deputy President Paul Mashatile, Cabinet colleagues, members of the Executive Committee for Finance, Honorable Members, Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Services. Fellow South Africans, I have the honor to table the following documents before this House. The Division of Revenue Amendment Bill, the Adjustment Appropriation Bill, the Rates and Monetary Amounts and Amendments of Revenue Laws, the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill, the Tax Administration Laws Amendment Bill, the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill, the ESCOM Debt Relief Amendment Bill, the revised 2023-24 Fiscal Framework, the 2023 Adjustment Estimate of National Expenditure, and the Medium Budget Policy Statement. Madam Speaker, allow me to join the President and the Nation and congratulating the Springboks on winning the 2023 World Cup. For a record fourth time, this is a proud moment that has unified and brought joy to South Africans. Thank you, Mapoko Poko, for reminding us that with preparation, commitment, unity, and resilience, you can conquer any adversity. In the same spirit, I'm honored to present the medium term budget policy statement. This policy statement outlines our resolve to, among other things, stabilize public finances while maintaining support for the most vulnerable and protecting frontline services. Fast track growth enhancing reforms this includes a new financing mechanism for large infrastructure projects. Reconfigure the structure and size of the state while strengthening its capacity to deliver quality public services. These priorities echo the message delivered by His Excellency the President during his address on Monday. Thank you for your commitment to staying the course of growth and sound public finances. Madam Speaker, the economic outlook over the medium term remains weak, reflecting the cumulative effect of power cuts, the poor performance of the logistics sector, high inflation, 
rising borrowing costs, and weaker global environment. The International Monetary Fund forecasts global growth to slow from 3.5% in 2022 to 3% in 2023 and 2.9% in 2024. The weaker growth outlook for China, South Africa's largest trading partner, the lower commodity prices, and the risk that the USA interest rate will remain high for longer means global economic environment is less supportive for South Africa's growth prospect. Domestically, we forecast a 0.8% growth in real GDP in 2023. This is 0.1% points lower than the growth projection at the time of the 2023 budget. Growth is projected to average 1.4% from 2024 to 2026. These growth rates are not sufficient to achieve our desired levels of development. However, our economy has shown signs of resilience. Real growth from this product, a measure of economic performance, is now above pre-pandemic levels. In the first half of the year, the economy grew by 0.9%, despite record levels of load shedding. The tourism sector grew more than 70%, in the period, driven by arrivals of more than 5.4 million international tourists. This year, we hosted the Formula E, the BRICS Summit, the Netball World Cup 2023, and this week, we welcome up to 700 delegates to the 20th Agua Forum in Johannesburg. We have put our best foot forward and reminded the world of the beauty of our country the warm spirit of our people, and the world-class facility for doing business and investing. Other sectors of the economy have also shown promising signs of growth in the first six months of the, of, of, of the year, including the construction sector growth by Coforma 2%, the agricultural sector growth by 7.8%, and the service sector is up 1.5%. Finance is 7.5%. In the words of the President, these are reasons for hope. Unfortunately, since February, the risk to the economy that we warned about, including the decline in global commodity prices that granted us substantial revenue last year, elevated inflation and the depreciation of the rand have materialized. As a result, our public finances are significantly weaker. The main budget deficit has increased by 54.7 billion compared with the 2023 budget, with the 2023 budget estimate. This reflects lower revenue performance, higher public service wages, uh, wage bill cost, and higher debt service cost. The main reason for this are a sharp fall in corporate income tax particularly from the mining sector, although personal income tax collection was better than forecast. The result of the shortfall is substantial worsening in the main budget deficit in the current fiscal year. We now project a deficit of 4.9% of GBT, GBT, GDP compared to our previous estimate of 4%. Under these circumstances, measures to stabilize public finances and reform the economy to generate higher growth are essential. We recognize that alongside these measures, our most effective way of funding government is through an efficient tax administration. And by broadening the tax base, SARS will continue its focus on enforcing compliance in areas such as debt collection, fraud prevention, curb illicit trade, voluntary disclosures, and encouraging honest taxpayers to comply voluntarily. Every additional round of revenue collected is one round less which have to be borrowed. Madam Speaker, allow me to frame our fiscal challenges as follows. Government spending exceeded revenue since the 2008 global financial crisis. These rising annual budget deficits 
have reached an extent where the government will have to borrow an average of 553 billion per year over the medium term. As a result of gross debt rising from 4.8 trillion in 2023-24 to 5.2 trillion in the next financial year, by 25-26 it will exceed 6 trillion mark. We now expect gross government debt to reach 77% of GDP by 25-26. This is higher than the level we forecast in February. Over the next three years, debt service costs are, as a share of revenue will increase from 20.7% in 2023 to 22.1% in 2026 27 the cost or interest of this debt for the next year alone amount to around about 385.9 billion. Over the MTF, interest costs amount to about 1.3 trillion. This is more than we spent on police, education, or health. It is important, however, to point out that our debt levels and rising debt service costs are not problems in and of themselves. Our challenge is that the rise in debt service costs are crowding out important social spending and our economy has not grown fast enough to support increasing expenditure or our current debt levels. Therefore, this policy statement sets out our strategy for avoiding a fiscal crisis and preventing the build-up of systematic risk to the economy. These decisions we have taken include spending reductions and reprioritization while also taking concrete steps to support growth. None of these decisions are taken lightly. They are taken in the short and long-term viability of public finances in mind. And in the interest of balance and inclusive growth, Madam Speaker, inefficiencies and wastages of scarce public resources is limiting our ability to effectively support services, uh, service delivery and economic growth. In this regard, the medium-term budget policy statement announces that action is being taken to review and reconfigure the structure and size of the state in line with the President's commitment in the 2023 State of the Nation Address. A joint plan to review government departments, entities and programs over the next three years is being prepared. This plan will address overlapping mandates and functions, including public entities, ensure, and ensure that we create standards for more sustainable remuneration of executives that serve public entities receiving transfers from the fiscal. We also intend to leverage this plan to better direct our scarce resources to priority areas. The President will make further announcement in this regard in due course. We understand that lowering debt and the budget deficit alone is not enough. It is for this reason that our fiscal strategy in this medium-term budget policy statement prioritizes reforms aimed at strengthening gross domestic product growth. To this end, excluding interest, funding for capital projects remains the fastest growing item by economic cl classification. I must repeat this. I must repeat this. To this end, excluding interest, funding for capital projects remains the fastest growing item by economic classification. Furthermore, we are introducing a new mechanism for improving the pace of delivery of capital projects. The medium-term budget policy statement also recognizes that government must respect the budget constraint to preserve sustainability of government services that are being crowded out by debt service costs. We propose a strategy of targeting spending adjustment based on policy priorities and a reconfiguration and rationalization of the state which includes closing or merging ineffective ent entities and programs and enhancing complementarity of its functions. Madam Speaker, 
the poor revenue performance requires an adjustment to spending both in year and over the medium term. In the current financial year, spending has been revised downward by 21 billion. This is still below prevailing underspending levels by department uh, and institution, which average 32 billion uh, per annum over the past three financial years. For the 24-25 and 25-26, the reductions are 64 billion and 69 billion respectively. These are based on current revenue projections and do not take into account future revisions to revenue forecast. The implications of these adjustments will be partial offset by departments implementing the cost containment guidelines issued by National Treasury, implementing control measures on payroll systems in line with the directive issued by the Department of Public Service and Administration, as well as implementing recommendations from the spending reviews conducted in the past two years, fiscal year. Government has made strategic decisions to allocate funds to frontline sectors such as health, education, and police services. Additional funding of 24 billion uh, this year and 74 billion over the medium term will be used to fund the 2023-24 wage increases and the associated carry-through cost in these sectors. 34 billion is allocated to extend the COVID-19 social relief of distress grant by another year. Over the medium term, a provisional allocation is retained while a comprehensive review of the entire social grant is finalized. The Presidential Employment Initiative will be extended for another year through repurposing a portion of funds from existing public employment programs such as the Extended Public Works Program and the Community Works Program. A comprehensive review of public employment program is underway. Honourable members, the Division of Revenue is an important tool for equitable allocation of funds to provinces and municipalities. Over the next three years, government proposes allocating 48% of available non-interest spending to national departments, 42% to provinces, and 9.9% to local government. We acknowledge the pivotal role of local government in delivering effective services to communities. We also recognize that the provincial and municipal spheres are under pressure to meet increasing infrastructure of demands. The government remains dedicated to support the sustainability and financial stability of our municipalities. Let there be no doubt effective local governance is the bedrock of service delivery. Equally, financial stable municipalities are the foundation of our nation's economic prosperity. With this in mind, I want to briefly address one of the most pressing issues facing our nation, water provision, water uh, management, and the state of our water treatment systems. Over the years, we've seen the impact of poor water management leading to polluted water sources and limited access to clean water for our citizens. This has largely been caused by dysfunctionality of many of our municipalities. To address this challenge, the government is making changes to the conditional grants, starting with the Urban Settlement Development Grant, the Integrated Urban Development Grant, and the Municipal Infrastructure Grant. These changes include reconfiguring of grants and revising the grants conditions to align them with the green drop, blue drop, and no drop assessment relaunch by the President in as, as part of efforts to ramp up the performance of water service authorities. In addition, we will be working with local government and the Department of Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs to develop a new funding model so that municipalities can continue to earn revenue through the transition to more self-generating of electricity by firms and households. Maybe let me explain this a bit. With the deregulation of the electricity industry, a large number of municipalities rely 
uh, rely, a number of municipalities rely on electricity as a revenue. With the provision of generation by, gener by private companies, that is likely to have a major impact on the revenue sources for municipalities. What that means, we need to relook as to what other sources of revenue for the municipalities will look like. To cater for the growing pressure imposed by climate change on infrastructure, especially at local level, we have created a resource pool to specifically respond to future disasters. In this regard, 370 million has been added to the Municipal Disaster Response Grant, while 1.2 billion has been added to the Municipal Disaster Recovery Grant to cover the repair and rehabilitation of infrastructure damaged by flooding in February and March 2023. Madam Speaker, mitigating the environmental risk posed by climate change must go hand in hand with addressing the financial and economic risks also posed by climate change. National Treasury is making progress towards developing a disaster risk financing strategy which will, among others, enhance existing risk financing instruments. Honored members, in the light of the difficult financial conditions faced by municipalities, addressing the ESCOM problem without dealing with the municipal non-payment and uptake of debt relief programs would have been counterproductive. The debt relief engagement uh, arrangement for ESCOM outlined in 2023 budget, noted that a large portion of outstanding municipal debt is owed to ESCO. National government has introduced support to relieve municipalities of debt to ESCO. Upon application by a municipality, the debt to ESCO up to the 31st of March 2023 will be written off over a three-year period of equal annual transfers. This is provided, the providing the municipalities complies with a set of conditions. These conditions include enforcing credit, uh, strict credit controls, enhanced revenue collection, and up-to-date payment of current account owed to ESCO. By October 2023, 67 applications had been submitted totaling 56.8 billion or 97% of total municipal debt owed to ESCOM at the end of March 2023. 28 applications have been approved. The remainder are being assessed and verified by provincial treasuries. The ultimate goal is the profound transformation of these municipalities by enabling them to build financial resilience amplify their capacity to generate sustainable revenue and rekindle a culture of paying for service rendered. Margaret Pumlega will speak. Strele no go basala. If sniga maspala lo mnyenye vuba banga pata banga pata na basala if nega na boba sniga disek pata le. What that means? Awa maspala. For them to qualify, Funega Benze prepaid meters. So that moving forward, so that moving forward, I come to the battle. We must battle the battle. We must battle the battle. Otherwise, this debt relief will not be uh, useful. Madam Speaker, our unemployed is not 70 billion rand indigent. Madam Speaker, the President stated in his address on Monday that more rapid and inclusive growth is the only solution to unemployment, poverty and inequality. Growth is also necessary for sustainability of public finances. Mr. President, I could not agree with you more. The medium-term budget policy statement supports measures to lift our growth prospect over the medium-term 
and restructures the state to become more effective. In its approach, the government is intentional about leveraging the collective wisdom of all stakeholders to realize the vision set out in the National Development Plan to create a better life for all. On electricity supply, we have experienced more power cuts in the year to September 23 than in the whole of 2023. However, over the medium term, additional generation capacity from renewable energy investment combined with the return of ESCOM's units that are out of service should ease power cuts. Our electricity system is undergoing an enormously positive transformation. We are reaping the fruits of our efforts to reform the electricity sector, including the easing of restrictions on self generation and encouraging private investment in the area. At the same time, we recognize the potential loss of revenue due to private electricity generation and the fact that traditional revenue models relied on by public entities like ESCOM face serious disruption. It is for this reason that our electricity reforms are holistic, evidence-based, and geared to finding a balanced solution to our electricity supply challenges. They take into account not just a particular entity, but the transformation of the sector as a whole. As part of this approach, the review of ESCOM coal fire power stations commissioned by National Treasury is complete. Effective implementation of the recommendations will help transform the electricity sector. It will also inform revision to ESCOM's corporate plan to bolster accountability and effective informed oversight. The government will shortly share the findings of, of the report. Madam Speaker, as part of the 2023 budget, we announced that ESCOM debt relief amounted to 250 billion from 23-24 to 25-26. The partial takeover of ESCOM's debt announced in February was done for two main reasons. The first was to ease pressure on the company's balance sheet and free it to invest in transmission and distribution infrastructure. I must add in also to increase maintenance. The second was that more than 330 billion rand of ESCOM debt was already government guaranteed, explicitly taking it on this, on, on this debt would reduce fiscal risk and enhance long-term fiscal sustainability. As we said in February, the allocations to ESCOM would be accompanied by strict conditions to ensure public funds are used for their intended purposes. On key conditions we set back then was that should ESCOM defy any of the conditions, the loan would not be converted into equity. The ESCOM Debt Relief Amendment Bill, which is, uh, we are tabling today, seeks to enhance that enforceability on the conditions agreed under the Debt Relief Agreement. It provides for the payment of interest by ESCOM on amounts advanced as part of the Debt Relief Law. The amendment also provides for the reduction of the amount of debt relief available to ESCOM in the event that the entity does not comply with the National Treasury conditions. These principles and strict conditionalities greatly enhanced by the amendment are a key part of how we will deal with ESCOM and all other state-owned endeavors, I must repeat, and all other state-owned enterprise entities to avoid a repeat of the mistakes of the previous bailouts. Madam Speaker, the transition to a low carbon economy should be integrated into a comprehensive green growth strategy and industrialization plans. This involves assessing policy conditions, challenges, and opportunities for diversification and investing in new industries. South Africa's traditional trading partners are intensifying their decarbonization plans. Many countries are introducing carbon pricing mechanisms to make emissions more expensive and incentivize emission reductions. In automotive, a major export and source of employment, the transition to new vehicles poses an essential, existential threat to South Africa's vehicle, 
production. The transition will require balancing domestic market demand, establishing renewable energy based charging infrastructure, and supporting production. The goal is to make sure the sector remains a major contributor to the industrial development of the domestic economy. As such, the government plans to implement tax and expenditure measures to support the automotive sector during this transition. Details will be provided in the 2024 budget review. Part of the broader strategy includes collaborating with other African countries to develop battery production capacity on the continent by pulling the critical mineral resource base that Africa is endowed with. South Africa's logistics system faces significant challenges, such as deteriorating rail performance and inefficient ports. Rail underperformance is estimated to have cost up to 5% of GDP in 2022, with losses in the region of 50 billion in the mineral sector alone. Given the scale of the challenges, the National Logistic Crisis Committee was instituted to broaden the reforms in the sector and prioritize reforms aimed at resolving the immediate crisis while also addressing the structural aspects hampering the sector. This approach is consistent with the key lessons from our reform of the electricity sector that resolve these challenges must be transforming the sector, not trying to save an entity. Madam Speaker, we acknowledge that Transnet the central role in moving goods and commodities to local international markets and the implications to business, uh, people's lives, the economy, and our global competitiveness when Transnet is dis dysfunctional. No modern economy can thrive and grow new industries if rail lines are beset by delays and ports are unable to efficiently handle incoming and on outgoing cargo. Transnet's performance is in, this regard, in this regard has been underwhelmingly and its, and its operations have been strained by a worsening financial state. Recognizes the seriousness of the situation, the National Treasury is working with Transnet and the Department of Public Enterprise to ensure that Transnet can meet its immediate debt obligations. Broader reforms of the logistics sector will be guided by the freight logistic roadmap. The roadmap sets out a clear path for enhancing efficiencies, facilitating the introduction of competition, and leveraging the financial and technical support of the private sector. Only once these three objectives are reflected in Transnet's corporate and operation plans will there be a conversation about whether and how government can provide financial support to transform the logistics sector. Investment in infrastructure is central to supporting high economic growth and expansion of access to basic services. We are seeking to facilitate a quantum shift in the quantity and quality of delivery by mobilizing private sector financing and technical expertise at scale. However, the infrastructure ecosystem is plagued by challenges that undermine efforts to fast track delivery. Among the challenges is the lack of a credible pipeline that can attract funding, lack of sustainable financing arrangements to crowd in private sector, and poor contract and project management to manage cost and schedule, scheduled overruns. In this regard, we are amending the Treasury regulation. Uh, Ukumbet Mamluku will be pleased, that's Regulation 16. In this regard, we are amending regulations, Treasury regulations, and key elements of the municipal legislation in line with the recommendations of the completed review of the public private partnership framework. The new regulations will be published by the time of the budget review 2024. We are also establishing and infrastructure financing and implementing support engines that will systematically address the need to crowd in private sector finance and expertise into the public infrastructure program. Government will also widen the scope for concessional borrowing by creating new mechanisms through which private sector investors 
and multinational institutions can co-invest with government for selected uh, infrastructure projects. These will include the use of built operate and transfer structures, triple P's, and concessions, and the application of front loading mechanism with provincial conditional grants, now, which now allows for it. Uh, we, by the way, we have started piloting the front loading. Well, we have just done one front loading now for housing in Northern Cape, which is our pilot, uh, uh, pilot project on, on front loading. The outcome will be clearer institutional arrangements for the private sector to invest in public infrastructure, an increase in pipeline of credibly infrastructure projects, and a greater access to various forms of financing and underpinned by effective delivery mechanism. These measures will unlock social infrastructure projects, blended finance, and triple please, including the electricity transmission infrastructure and upgrades to railway lines, among other, other projects. That will be fast-tracked. The 2024 budget will provide further details on these measures. Madam Speaker, we've tabled the public procurement bill in Parliament. The bill seeks to create a singly regulatory public procurement framework and envisage it in section 27, subsection one of the constitution. The bill also determines a, prefer a preferential procurement framework for all procuring institutions within which to implement their procurement policies. In other words, in other words, Ningati Akuko BE, you prefer non procurement group BE. Bangadana BE la bill. The bill went through an extensive consultation process in government and NEDLEC. It also considers recommendations of the Zondo Commission and the President's response to Parliament that too. The public has been afforded an opportunity to submit written comments followed by public hearings that were conducted through parliamental processes during September. We are supporting the parliamental processes that are considering the bill and we look forward to the outcomes. We're also working with the development partners to modernize the procurement system, eliminate bottlenecks, and make it more agile to deliver services. As part of the procurement reforms, several SCM instructions issued over the years have become a challenge and unnecessary humble operation of special of, of a special section scheduled to public entities. We have reviewed these instructions with a view to relaxing them to unlock bottlenecks in the system. This is also in keeping with the constitutional court judgment in the preferential procurement regulations of 2017 to allow organs of state to develop their own policies pending the finalization of the public procurement bill. Madam Speaker, crime is a safety, economic, and social issue. A safe environment for our people to, fall, to fully participate in the economy and social life is non-negotiable. Fighting crime is a key ingredient of enhancing economic growth. This fiscal framework notes this policy priority and protects personnel intensive functions such as the police while supporting a range over the crime-fighting efforts. We're also working hard to address deficiencies in our fight against organized crime and illegal financial flows. Since February, when South Africa was grey-listed by the Financial Action Task Team, a large number of government departments and agencies, including the police, the Hawks, NPA, SIU, SSA, the Reserve Bank, FACA and SARS have been working hard to address these deficiencies. The FATF noted at its plenary meeting last week that such work is showing positive results, with South Africa having addressed 15 of the 20 technical deficiencies in our legal framework and making good progress on 17 of the 22 effectiveness action 
items, including two that are now deemed to be largely addressed. However, there's also a significant amount of work that must still be done, particularly with regard to the investigation and prosecution of complex money laundering cases and terror financing. The identification of informal mechanism for remitting money around the world and the recovery of the proceeds from crime and corruption. Government expects to address all these deficiencies identified by FATF by early 2025. We are also devising ways to make better and more targeted use of the criminal asset recovery account to address crime. Among these efforts and, 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 and emanating from the presidential project on illicit mining strategy, a recommendation has been made for cabinet to consider using money from the fund to strengthen the capability of our law enforcement agencies in dealing with criminal activities such as illegal mining, construction site extortion, and making our communities safer. The South African police, the defense force, the Financial Intelligence Center, the Department of Home Affairs, and the Border Management Authority have all received allocation from this fund. We are also improving the legislative environment in areas such as financial management and financial governance. These reforms will respond to the recommendations of the Zondo Commission, the Mpati Commission, and the Nujet Commission. I am, will shortly table an ominous omnibus bill for public consultation, which will include key amendments to various pieces of legislation, including the Public Finance Management Act of 1999, the Municipal Finance Management Act of 2003, the South African Revenue Service Act. Madam Speaker, the lived experience of many South Africans do not reflect our development ideals. The expectation, the expectation of a vibrant, inclusive, sustainable economy that works for all South Africans is not a perpetual quest uh, to aspire to. It is a reasonable and achievable endeavor. For, this part, for, for its part, this medium-term budget policy statement expresses government's commitment to stabilize the foundation upon which this economy lies. In summary, the medium-term budget policy statement commits government to continue to support the economy, stabilize public finances, and protect the social wage. We do this by fast-tracking the implementation of structural reforms, key being the electricity and logistics sectors, to lift our growth prospects, adopting prudent fiscal stance that support growth, promotes investment, and prevents the build-up of systemic risks to the economy, directing scarce fiscal resources towards the key uh, priority areas, including frontline services and social protection, while reducing inefficiencies and wastage. Drawing inspiration from the Spring Rules, I'm convinced that we are united and remain committed to this strategy that will lift up our growth prospect. We leverage the power of the collective. We pres persevere in this difficult environment. We will come out victorious. I'm grateful to the President, Deputy President, for their continued support and leadership. And thank you to the Deputy Minister of Finance and National Treasury team, led by the new, brand new Director General, Dr. Duncan Peterson. I would like to thank Mr. Ishmael Momoinait for his sterling contribution during his 29 years of service in the National Treasury in many rules, most recently as Acting Director General. His commitment to sustainable, transparent, and accountable public finances and the values of our constitution is an example for all, is an example for all of us. Thank you to the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Services, the Governor of the South African Reverse Bank. Thank you to many colleagues in the Minister's Committee on the Budget and then the Budget Council who shared the heavy load of tough decisions that we make to maintain sustainable public finances. To Parliamentary Committee of Finance, whose chief whip, whose whip had the best, best day yesterday. Uh, to the appropriation in public accounts, I express my sincere appropriation. 
appreciation. To my wife and family, <laughs> to, to, what? To my wife and family. And by the way, today I've been joined by my last born, who, who believes that my decision, my choice of career is not a good one. I decided to invite him. I don't know whether after this interaction what his views will be about my choice of career. Thank you very much. Tiabule. Honorable Minister, the papers tabled by the Minister will be referred to the relevant committees. Order. Honorable Members, I would like to advise you that there are books available outside of the Chamber where you can write your congratulatory messages for the Springboks. I thank you. Order. I request members to stand and wait for the chair and the mace to leave the chamber. That concludes the business of the day and the House is adjourned. <laughs>